And welcome to the 28th episode of the Techno Buffalo Show. I'm one of your two hosts for today, Sean Ani. I'm the editor-in-chief of the site, and I'm joined by executive editor of mobile, Todd Hazelton. Hey, everybody. How are you doing today, Todd? I'm good. Great. You're looking very sporty and yuppie. And... Yeah, I know. I finally went and got some winter clothes the other day when I was, uh, I told you I was at Pep Boys getting an oil change, so I had to walk around the mall, which I never do, and I was like, I need sweaters and stuff. It's getting cold here. That, that's actually Pep Boy's uh, whole plot there. They have a profit sharing <laughs> program with all the stores. Yeah, probably. <laughs> they keep you in the mall as long as humanly possible. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's all a big conspiracy. It really did, though. I mean, I think I was there for like two and a half hours. Like, come on, it's an oil change. And they and I had an appointment, you know, I don't know, long story. But I think they do. Well, if only there was an app that could just change your oil for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Soon. But unfortunately, we're not there. Yeah, maybe in the contest you're going to be judging. Yeah, that's right. We can talk about that a little bit. Yes, yes. Um, Tell so everyone. Techno Buffalo teaming up with the MTA in New York City, which is the public transit authority here, and then uh, with AT and T and I think New York Polytechnic again this year. And we did the same thing last year, and basically um, over several months app developers who want to get access to all this data and this year they're opening up um, historic bus times, historic train times and they're even working with transit wireless and some beacons and so developers can use all these tools and create new apps for commuters um, whether it's like you know getting around the subway station easier and with beacons hopefully you know you can see exactly like where you are in a subway I hope somebody comes up with that and then so last year it was in May, we judged a hackathon where they had 24 hours to create this app. And then uh, app one, I can't believe they made it in 24 hours. Um, and basically it just allowed you to find uh, the performers in the subways and their music. And like in New York City, these the subway performers are all professional musicians, so they're really good. Um, so you might want to find that. And then the, the winner was City Mapper, which is now like a hugely popular iOS and Android application. It's it, you know, surpassed New York City. It's everywhere, right? or in a lot of major cities. Um, so this year they have better tools, and we'll be doing the same thing, judging. And it should be really exciting, actually. I, I was just going to say, now, if somebody could come up with a, a beacon-based app that helps you avoid the panhandlers. Yeah, right? Like panhandler here, panhandler here. <laughs> it's kind of like ways for panhandlers. Yeah, but it's amazing. Like, So imagine, um, I don't think the, well, the subway data should help because it's gathered so frequently that you should have an idea of like live subway trains but with the buses especially even last year you could see like on a map like the bus coming down which is really really neat I just you know this year they have access to even more data so I, I can't wait to see what they come out, comes out of it I think that's really cool and when's the final judging um, I think last year it ended in September so I suspect around the same time although I don't know if it's a full year we'll see I have to check the calendar very cool yeah, well, I, I hope you have fun with it. I hope some people come up with some great apps for you to, to judge. Yeah. But moving on into the world of the news for the week, um, I cannot believe how much we're hearing about the Galaxy S6. I know. It seems like every day there's something else. And, it, you know, my first gut reaction was, wow, it's pretty early for that. But if you think about it, it's really not, right? It's November, and then... I'm just thinking, like, in terms of big trade shows coming up, we have CES, which is going to, you know, these years it's mostly TVs and stuff. Um, and I think the Z1S came out last year from Sony for T-Mobile. Yeah, uh, Sony always case, has a phone there. Yeah, and then we have um, Mobile World Congress, which is typically in February, but this year it's in March, early March. And the rumors are saying that Samsung's going to release the Galaxy S6 a month ahead of time in March this year which means that, I mean, to me, that tells me that they're going to release it and, and, and announce it in the same month, possibly in March. Or there's just some mix-up along the lines, and, and you know, instead of February, because Mobile World Congress isn't in February, it's in March this year, and that's simply when Samsung's going to announce it and then release it in April, as it always does. But in any case, lots of rumors saying it might have two curved sides. That was from an analyst. But to me, it, 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 it does make a little sense, considering the Galaxy Note Edge is out there. Um, it takes advantage of the edge side panel really well, 
and Samsung's building up a developer base for this. So I think if they're going to push it, why not push it with another flagship? And so maybe maybe it's just a special edition of the Galaxy S6. Maybe it's a S6 Edge. I don't know. Or the actual S6 will have that. And then I think uh, two versions of the processor, they're saying 64-bit Exynos makes sense given Lollipop support, 64-bit processors, or Snapdragon 810. And, uh, and then storage options, somebody said like 128 gig up to, which I think we discussed on an earlier show, which would be wild. You know, you could put 256 gigs of storage on the phone. But, uh, yeah, so it sounds like it's going to be exciting. My, my bigger question is, what in the world happened to 2014? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> over. How are we already discussing CES and, and Mobile World Congress? I mean, didn't we just get back from CES? It seems like it. <laughs> and now we're falling right back into it. But I, I, are, I booked my flight already. Yeah, I still need to do that. Super exciting times for, for tech. Day. But this year it never really slowed down, right? Like we would say, like, oh, maybe this month it'll be a little slower than last. And just like month after month after month, we're getting slammed. It, it, this was easily the craziest year I've ever seen for announcements in for new. I've always planned my vacation for later in November because that's a quiet period. I'm almost nervous that something's going to come up. Right. <laughs> you know what's even more incredible? Because... Sorry, I cut you off. Oh no, go ahead. For me, what's even more incredible is that you know, it, it, once it was say phones and TVs. I'm just you know being really simple here. But now it's and then it was phones and tablets and TVs and stuff. And now it's like phones and tablets and TVs and wearables and like there's just more and more and more. And, and you know, once upon a time it was printers too. But I don't, you know, we're not really. I don't think anyone cares about those anymore. <laughs> right. But you know, you add in all the video game news that comes out. Right. Like, is no longer just E3 or Gamescom. It's just all throughout the year. There's gaming news coming out, mm -hmm. and it's just. It's mind-boggling to me just how much stuff is coming out these days. It's nuts, but... Yeah, no lack of right. content. You're right. I mean, with March isn't that far away, so if this truly is the plan for the S6, it makes sense that we're starting to hear about it. Um, I, I'll be really interested to see, because this really... It, it say, seems like it's shaping up to be the first of the new design language, the first of the new strategy of not releasing a phone every three weeks. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because so, yeah, that's what Samsung had said, you know, following the last earnings, it's phone sales aren't where they want them to be anymore. They're going to start with Project Zero, I guess, is the rumor. That's supposed to be the Galaxy S6. And I think we'll see them continue to move forward with these Galaxy Alpha, Galaxy Note 4 style devices with the nice metal edges, feel real premium. Just hopefully a new strategy in that direction. Which is why yesterday we saw just concept images that were posted by 3G UK. Um, and at first it was like, uh, you know, like that's easy. Just, you know, take a take a Galaxy Alpha and make it bigger. But I think there's also, you know, some truth to those images because if Samsung, if, if say the Galaxy Alpha was sort of like an experiment or like to get things up and running, then, you know, it's really plausible, I think, that we'll see the Galaxy S6 take shape in, in that kind of form. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It'll be interesting to see where this goes. Um, speaking of sixes, mm -hmm. the Nexus Six. Yeah. You you wrote a great editorial yesterday about where is this thing? Yeah, like what's going on? Well, and then after you left yesterday, we got the news that T-Mobile was going to have to delay its launch because it didn't get its shipment. Mm hmm. I saw that. Yeah. You know, what is going on with this phone? Where is it? Yeah, so I thought this was a good question. One of our colleagues uh, texted me while I was hanging out at Pet Boys in the Mall <laughs> and said, you know, basically, Google can't keep this thing in stock, right? Motorola can't keep it in stock. Google can't. You can't find it anywhere. It's not in carrier stores yet. They're only taking pre-orders. They're pushing it back. Like, what's going on? If this was Apple, people would be up in arms and saying, like, this is ridiculous. What's going on with Apple? Like, you know, they got to get their stuff together. Um, and I said, my quick reaction answer was, well, Google doesn't control manufacturing, and Apple does. And Apple's more of a hardware company, and Google's not. Google's focused on search and, and software and stuff like that. It doesn't build its own hardware. So it relies on its manufacturing partners. 
And the answer was like, well, that, you know, still, Google should have the power to say, hey, Motorola, you know, make these handsets and make them available. We want them for everybody. So then I thought, that's a good point, too. Um, and, I, and I really don't have an answer. But then I thought, well, maybe it could be a transitional period for Motorola. You know, the, the deal with Lenovo just closed. So Lenovo is probably trying to figure out, like, how they're handling manufacturing, what they're doing with there. The response back was, but this has happened every year with Nexus devices, and that's true. It has. It's been really hard to find, like, say, last year Nexus 5. Uh, every year it's been difficult. And, and I thought, well, maybe it's just been difficult because they were low-priced, and for people you know, like ourselves, enthusiasts, that are just jumping out and buying them all and saying, you know, great price, I'm going to buy this. Um, but then, finally, I think it's also that Google doesn't want to step on the toes of other OEMs, right? So they don't, I don't think... Google always positions this as a platform for other manufacturers to base their designs off of, right? Like, here's what you can do with it if you want to. But I don't really think that's the case anymore, and I think more and more as people are saying, and even Google's targeting this as a consumer device, right? Like, it's being sold in Best Buy. It's being sold by carriers. It's being sold with the Nexus player in these outlets, um, Android Wear. It's really just showing this whole ecosystem of devices, and so I think that to be careful, and this is just, you know, putting on a tinfoil hat, Google doesn't want to step on Samsung's toes or anybody else's toes and, and have consumers think, well, like, well, this is the device you should buy. Ignore those folks. Because they're still huge, hugely valuable partners, especially Samsung on that end, and, and LG and, and, you know, everybody else that sells products with Google Play services. So I think that's the point, too, that Google's trying to be probably pretty cautious and not say, like, hey, here's the high-end flagship you should buy versus a Note 4. And in the end, it's probably smart because I don't think Google's making more off of a Nexus 6 than it is off of a Note 4. I don't know the truth in that, but, you know, it's Motorola's device. Well, then here's the question. I mean, and I tend to agree with you. They don't want to anger the OEMs. Mm-hmm. It, why even keep doing the Nexus line then? Yeah, well, I think that's sort of that's sort of the point. At least when I had meetings with Google recently in New York City, we walked in and saw. Um, let's see, I want to say we sat down and saw the Nexus player, and it's like here's Google in the living room and all of your apps and your movies that you've purchased, right? And then we walked over and we saw Android Wear devices. Here's Google on your wrist and everything you can do connected to your phone. Then we walked over and saw the Nexus 6. Here's Google on your phone. And then we saw the Nexus 9. Here's Google on your tablet. And I think it's just about showing, like, Google has an ecosystem. It's going to tap partners and show you how it imagines this should work. And in this case, it's Lollipop. Here's Lollipop and Android Wear and everything across the board. And we have manufacturers that can do this, too. And I think that's the point. But I think in some ways, it's just the Nexus line sort of their consumer-facing Google brand you know, in Best Buy, they have a section that says, like, you know, here's this. And, and often, you'll find other Android tablets right there, too. But I think it's really just, like, sort of the, I don't want to say benchmark, but the, you know, the clean slate, this is what we're offering, and then our partners can offer more in some cases or similar or whatever. But that's my take on it, anyway. I, I don't know. It's interesting, you know, I... I just wonder if maybe the frustration level that everyone's feeling that you know from the people that do want to buy a Nexus Six and they're having trouble buying it, That's you know, it, yeah, it, like you said yesterday in your article, you know, if this happened with Apple, everyone would be livid, you mm-hmm. know, and and Apple stock would collapse. Now, I mean, admittedly, this is a very very small portion. This is nothing compared to the problem Google's having this morning with the double click servers for apps. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that, that's a slightly bigger problem. Um, so I don't know. It, it's just it's been interesting to watch, and the fact that T-Mobile didn't get its full shipment, it makes you wonder what's going to happen with Sprint and AT&T and everybody else. Mm-hmm. So. I don't know. It's been an interesting. Well, Prince, it sounds like already has theirs because they're already promising stock like later this week, right? I think Friday. Not the, positive, but... Yeah, they're promising, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how much is there. Right? Yeah, you know, you know, it, in every store. It's kind of like when you read those Black Friday ads real close, and it says seven per store. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Terrible. Yeah, some of those awesome deals I've seen. You know, and then you read the fine print: six per store. 
Right. Yeah, at least Walmart's promising you know a one hour guarantee, but yeah, which is good. And then, but I saw like their one hour guarantee, and uh, I think we have it up on the site. It's coming soon. But their one hour guarantee is like, I guess you can buy it, but then it's like promised before Christmas or something. Yeah, <laughs> like, they, give you, they give you a rain check, and so when it comes in again, you can still get the Black Friday price. Oh, perfect. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and speaking of, uh, Sasha Bahal has a question. Is it worth going Black Friday shopping? Oh, but it depends on what you need. I mean, there's some great deals. Walmart selling, what, like a 55-inch TV for 200-something bucks? The, the thing to remember about those, though, a lot of times... Special it, model, right? They're a special model that's only for Black Friday. Usually, like, the model number will end in BF, and... They've done something to it. It's not quite what you're expecting. On televisions, I honestly would not do Black Friday. Mm-hmm. But for things like, say, a gaming system, if, you know, if you've got a PS4 but you want an Xbox One and vice versa, I mean, there's going to be some massive deals going on on game consoles. Yeah, on those bundles were great. Like, comes with two free games. Or crazy. Now, that being said, I used to do Black Friday. I used to, you know, go to Walmart at 3 in the morning and wait in line and everything else. And now I leave the country. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. I, I, I land in Manchester on Black Friday morning, and I just ignore the... I, I, like, two years ago, I had my mother order a Grand Theft Auto 4 for me on Amazon. <laughs> that was my, my last involvement. I... Black Friday can be great depending on what you're looking for. Just use your best sense. I mean, if you're going after a, a known product, a product that can't be messed with, you know, be an iPad Air, a game console, a video game, whatever, just weigh the money savings versus your time and your stress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so... I don't know. It, it's a tough question. It just depends. It's definitely a younger person's game, I feel. Yeah, <laughs> I've never done it, and I—I yeah, I don't know. Oh, I've I guess done I it a couple. Of them. Yeah, I—I've got my parents a laptop one year at Walmart because they needed a laptop in '89, and it was a ridiculous laptop. I was like, "Fine, I'll go at three in the morning and wait in line." Mm-hmm. And the store was only going to have fifteen of them, and I got like the fifth one, I think. Right. But yeah, it's just—it's it's a matter of. How much is your time worth? All right. That's a, that's always a big question for me on anything. But <laughs> all right. So going through some of the other questions here, uh, interesting one um, from Sahal Raja. What fitness wearables do you guys wear? I currently don't wear one. I wear a Pebble right now, but I am considering picking up an Up Twenty Four before I go on vacation. I love those. Up. I had the yeah. A very, and he's absolutely in love with it, and I'm, I don't know, I, I keep going back and forth. Do I really need this in my life? They're cool, um, and I, I feel like they still do a bit more, especially like if you're trying to manage like what you're eating, and you can add all that in the software. Right now, I don't, I don't you watch R, which I still got to review, <laughs> and uh, but it tells me like a general idea of how much I've moved throughout the day. Um, my favorite to date was the Jawbone Up. I've, I still have my eye on the Up24 myself, actually. Um, difference between those was the added Bluetooth functionality. The other one, you had to plug into your phone to upload the data all the time. Um, I don't know, but we'll see. Coming up, it looks like there's a lot. Um, Fitbit just announced several. Surgical. The thing is, it doesn't tie in with Apple Health Kit, which Apple obviously doesn't like because it pulled Fitbit from its stores. <laughs> Uh, and not that yeah. it matters. I mean, you can use it with other platforms too, and the app still works and all that. But if you wanted, you know, everything in Apple Health Kit, you won't get it with the the Fitbit products. And then uh, what Misfit has a really nice. What's their their cheapest one? It's like fifty bucks, and those work pretty well. Yeah. Too. And they have really great battery life, but again, no Bluetooth functionality, which for me, I, I kind of it's manual. It's not all the time. Yeah, I I just ha- I haven't dived into there, but I, I'm starting to look at it. Uh, I really don't want to know what how it rates my sleep because I know I don't sleep well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 
I don't know. Something to think about, but uh, currently neither of us wear them on a regular basis, but maybe down the road. Uh, let's see here. What else have we got? Uh, from Benjamin McDonald, what do you think about the Nexus 9? You and I were discussing this just before the show. Yeah. <sighs> Um, well, we reviewed it, and we praised it in our review in some areas and knocked it in others. The software experience is great. It's a great way to get into Lollipop, um, and it runs it really well. It's got the Tegra K1 processor, handles it. Everything's super smooth, super quick. On our units, though, uh, the back depresses a bit on the Nexus logo. Um, it, it, the black unit gets really fingerprinty, especially, like, the, just the screen, the back, too, um, the front-facing speakers are great. They're not, like, super high quality, but it's nice having them on the front. Um, I just felt like it didn't live up to HTC's industrial design standards. Um, we've long come to expect some of the greatest hardware from HTC, and yet here this comes out, and it just doesn't feel like it lives up to, to what you get from HTC in, in every yeah. product, really. I, I've got mine here, and... And the screen's not great, and it leaks really badly. Oh, yeah, it's leaking at the bottom of mine right now. I I don't know. I mean, I, luckily I picked it up on the HTC deal for $200. $400? Yeah, 200 bucks, great tablet. I'm not sure, I, you know. Yeah, I'm it's hard for me to knock it at $200. Yeah, and we were talking before the show, one of our favorite, our other favorite Android tablets is the NVIDIA Shield Tab. Front-facing speakers, Tiger K1 processor, they've promised Lollipop is coming, and they have a focus on games, if you like that. So, like, I, it's a little smaller, but I think, overall, like, the build quality, everything there, to me, is more attractive, unless you need the bigger screen. And need pure, absolutely pure Lollipop. Lollipop, guaranteed quick updates and stuff like that. Well, I guess they're not really guaranteed anymore, right? Like, Nexus no, 7 I, hasn't gotten Lollipop. Yeah. My Nexus 7 from last year hasn't been. But you been should. Yeah. Right. But you I, should. And get it, so. Just continuing tradition, devices in Sean's hand. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a phone. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's a decent tablet. I don't like it as much as the Nexus 7. Yeah, I like the Nexus 7. It was sort of unique, like it felt like a book. We've said that in the past. Which I, I like the form factor better. Mm-hmm. But it's easier. Yeah. Run. And, and I am excited to try the uh, the keyboard accessory. We haven't played with that yet. And, and see how well it does for work and stuff. Like If I can actually use this to write blog posts and stuff, I'd, you know, I'd find more, a lot more value in it. That's just my yeah. use. No, I totally agree with you. Uh, from Michael Van Hoot, I, I hope I said your name correctly, Michael. Uh, do you guys think the Nexus 6 camera is good mainly because of the hardware or because the new camera API and Lollipop? The Nexus 5 had decent hardware camera-wise but performed average. So I can't speak really well to the camera um, on the Nexus 6. We're still working on our review. Um, but I would guess it's a mix of both, to be honest. Um, I know Google's tried to put a focus on the camera APIs, uh, and the hardware should be up to snuff, but I honestly haven't played with it. It's out in Irvine long enough to, like, make a judgment call on that, so I really don't have an answer. But if it follows in the same footsteps as last year and it's not great, hopefully Google does issue updates and, and fixes it, but it, I'm, I'm hoping it's good out of the box. Yeah, I... I would imagine it's a combination of things because the camera on the Nexus 5 was probably one of the biggest complaints. Yeah, out of the box, and then it got better. But Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, bu- 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 uh, here's a good question from Sasha Bahal about what will 2015 be the year of? Wearables, I think. I mean, I think it's just getting started. Everything is so so new in the wearable space. Everybody's still trying to get off the ground. But I think we're starting to see real use cases. We're starting to see mass adoption where, like, you know, it's not just early adopters anymore. And this is, I'm talking wearables. And that means fitness trackers and stuff. And then, you know, I think 
as people get used to those or see value in that, maybe they'll start to see smartwatches too. But I think smartwatches, conversely, are very much in their infancy. But in general, I think this will be a bigger year for wearables across the board. I, I think, though, we, we still... Okay, so we know the Apple Watch is coming next year. And that should push wearables in the smartwatch space more into the mainstream and more into the public consciousness. Mm -hmm. I am still not 100% convinced that the public wants smartwatches and wearables. Right. And it's just, there will definitely be a niche for them. But do you think that the mass market, the average Joe walking down the street gives a hoot? About smartwatches yet? No, not at all. I think they just look at them like, oh, that's cool. I don't do you, but do you think that can ever change? <laughs> yeah, I think it can change, but it relies on, I think, two major factors. Like, there, A, there's no huge killer app for the smartwatch yet. Tracking could really boost that killer app, um, but it's going to have to be really good and really accurate, and we don't see that yet. And B... I don't think battery life is even close to where it needs to be. People need to be able to put this on their wrist and not worry about it. In the sense that the pebble's kind of there, but not really, right? Like, it's still not perfect. I think no. to get my mom, no, it's, say, it's, to wear a you know. Yeah, I mean, I basically... It needs to have good... I, I keep losing it for a little bit there, Todd, so that, that's why I keep breaking up. Um... I basically wear the the pebble as a notification thing. Mm -hmm. I, there is no one killer app on the pebble that makes me go, oh, I have to wear my pebble. No, it's just it's a nicety to me to be able, you know, as I'm typing in and go, oh, okay, I got an email from so and so. Oh, okay, I got a text message. You know, mm -hmm. and that that's about it. And so I just I don't see Joe and Jane Smith. Smith walk going, oh, I couldn't live without my smartwatch. Right, exactly. Like, I, when I wear my regular watch instead of a smartwatch, rarely do I say, oh, man, if only I'd had, you know, my Android Wear on today. I think that's changing. It's getting better. And especially during a busy work day, it's a lot more valuable to me. Like, I see no need for Android Wear on the weekends, right? So if you don't need it all the time, then, like, why why are people going to be spending you know three hundred dollars and more on these products? I think it needs to have real right. real life value. Like I can't the same way a smartphone is. Like when you first bought your first smartphone, you were like, whoa, I've been missing out on this for so long. Like I can't live without a smartphone. In that kind of sense, like when are we going to hit that level of I can't live without a wearable? I don't see that this year, but who knows? It needs BlackBerry seventy two ninety. Yeah right yeah. Mine was the uh, Samsung Blackjack on Singular. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Windows. So, yeah, I, I to his question, yeah, I do, I think wearables are going to be the big focus in 2015. I don't see smartphones changing that much. Tablets, I think, are pretty much... And let's, let's actually, let's discuss that for just half a second. The... We, we've been hearing a lot about, you know, falling iPad sales and all that. And I know we've touched on this before. But in general, how often does a person need to upgrade their tablet? Yeah, like, not that often. I mean, for... I get it. Like, when you add in an 8x processor and it's like, this is amazing for photo and video editing and gaming, you know, with metal and all kinds of stuff then you might, like a, a small select population might be like, I need that tablet. But for the rest of us who use the iPad in bed for magazine reading, for books, for email, and for messaging, there's no real need to upgrade, and, and not for many years. And I think for that to change, you know, you need, we need to change the use case scenarios of these tablets. And I think that's why we see Apple... Samsung, a lot of people targeting the enterprise because, uh, for example, we, we saw yesterday a report on Apple hiring a new sales team uh, to mm -hmm. target the enterprise. It's teaming up with IBM, and I think that that's, that can help, you know, boost those sales where otherwise it wasn't selling 
much of anything at all. Like I know, okay, like the iPads in Enterprise, we already know that, but it's not. There's not a huge support system in place, and that's what's going to change with Apple Care for Enterprise. They offer 24/7 support. They have, you know, a guy that's or a woman, you know, a team member assigned to every team to help you deploy this. And I think that's where you start to see, especially in a demanding place where, say, Enterprise needs something for modeling or something, then maybe they do need to upgrade more frequently at least more frequently than a consumer that's using it for email at home. I don't know the answer, but I think as as we rely on tablets more for more than just regular stuff, then we'll start to see, you know, annual adoptions seem to be more necessary. But when you think about it, we, we only upgrade phones every two years, too, if you're on a contract. I mean, people like you and I upgrade more frequently than that, but the regular person. Yeah. And computers, too. Like my desktop here is, I mean, it's desperately in need of swap out, but I think they go, you know, about three years, so. Yeah. No, we'll I mean, but, yeah, I, like, I'm not upgrading, you know, I've got the, the last 17-inch MacBook Pro, uh, which was 2011. It still, it has a couple issues. I, I might just swap the hard drive out in it, but in general, I have no burning desire to upgrade, so I don't know why people are so freaking out about the idea that Apple's not selling as many iPads as it did a year ago, that doesn't mean the tablet market is dead. And I've seen people go, well, you know, maybe tablets weren't what we all thought they were. No, I think they are. I just think you all have to get used to the idea we don't need to upgrade them every single year. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's almost like, like a catch-22, too, because you buy a tablet from Apple and you're going to get the latest software update, at least, and it's going to at least work on tablets, say, about a year or two. Right? And about two years, yeah. Or S and the older iPads doesn't work as well. And so so especially you don't need to upgrade. Like if Apple said, okay, iOS 8, here it is, it's amazing, it offers all these new features, but it's only available on the new devices, well then maybe people would be more willing to upgrade and, and resell their other ones and it would be a totally different idea. But I think everybody's glad that Apple doesn't do that. And nobody does. It, I mean... Samsung's pretty yeah. good about issuing updates to its older tablets. A lot of the HTC has their 90-day promise for some. I don't know if they have it for. Well, I guess this is their first tablet, right, in a long time. So no first tablet in a long time. But if they issue other tablets, hopefully they have the 90-day guarantee and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, good question here from uh, Sahal Raja, and this is definitely more in your ball court. Uh, what is the point of 64-bit? Yeah, so I think it, and I saw this question, and I was trying to think more about it, but it should enable more powerful applications to run at the same time and better take advantage of memory, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly on how 64-bit works. And we saw that, obviously, with the move from 32-bit to 64-bit Windows, and now it's happening on, on Android. But in order for everybody to take advantage of it, I'm almost certain that app developers also have to design their apps to run on 64-bit processors. So I think hopefully it just means that everything's going to run smoother, you get more powerful apps, um, and it can handle it better on a processor. I guess that's the simplest answer. Okay, this just came across Twitter from uh, Shar Tipkin. Excuse me. Uh, Samsung's Hong says global wearable market will grow to 135 million in 2018 from 22 million in 2014. Seems plausible as they get more. I mean, I'm just I, thinking. I'm more shocked that they think that they sold 22 million wearables in 2014. Yeah, is this their own? <laughs> uh, well, they have bundled deals too, which makes it more desirable. But if you think about it, 122 million, that's what, a third of the United States. You get, I, I could see, I guess, the entire wearable market globally, and that's if they're being sold everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it seems plausible. If it's at 22 now, that's only five times, right? Yeah. Over five times. Uh, this is Six not times. a question, but it's a commentary on what we were just saying about tablets from Scott Ott. I want... I want to want an iPad Air 2, but I can't want to. It's frustrating. I no longer need something between my Moto X, my iMac, and Kindle Paper White. I do have a first-gen iPad that I use for Words with Friends and an occasional iBook. That's a good point. We have so many other devices now. I think that tablets, not just iPads, but tablets in general, they have to fill a very specific task for you. Mm-hmm. 
you know, like my iPad, yes, I use it for some work stuff, but it's primarily an entertainment device for me, especially when I'm on a plane. But I don't think everybody, you know, if you have a laptop and a phone or a desktop and a phone, not all those people need a tablet. Right. right. I keep thinking now that I have the iPhone 6 Plus, like I don't really need the iPad mini, although I like having the slightly bigger screen, and I'm like, eh, now I kind of want the iPad Air too, and maybe I'll get rid of the mini. It's it's hard, and I understand where, you know, you're coming from on that too. And, and this applies, sorry, I also have the Note 4 and the Nexus 9, so like, I, it's same situation, like, I don't yeah. know where I want to go with this. And I also like smaller tablets, so it's it's tough. For me, I really want a tablet that I can actually work on. And I have it, a lot of people say that you can really do that with the iPad Air, too, and I think, you know, for a lot some industries where you're doing email and obviously working with Word and stuff like that, which is now free, then you could do it, but... For me, I guess it's it's really hard to like blog and stay in touch with everybody on chat and get worked on. Like the multitasking for me just isn't right there yet. I could do it with the Surface Pro Three, but it's also you know thousand bucks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, from Dominique Weber, what do you think about the Philae landing, which is the comet landing? Yeah. I I think it's insanely exciting. I am a little concerned the harpoons didn't fire. They're trying to figure that out right now. Uh, considering that the the probe was up there for 10 years you know it the fact that one thing has gone wrong <laughs> is simply amazing yeah uh, unfortunately right. that's a rather important thing because that helps anchor it to the comet so they're trying to figure that out right now but I, I think this is a massive step forward for space exploration and I, I can't wait to see where we go from here yeah I thought it was incredible it's, it's weird to think about right you just landed on comet yeah, I know. Crazy. Uh, from Joey, Joey Davidson, he sent this uh, link to me while we've been on the show, so I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Have you guys seen the new Samsung rap video? Should Techno Buffalo only do videos on rap form from <laughs> here on out? Um, I saw it sent, but we I couldn't watch it yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't... I'm trying to envision in my mind John Rettinger rapping, and it's it's not pretty. Yeah, it's not pretty at all. I guess for our viewers, it's titled, "Is it is this, this talent management thing?" I assume Samsung Sustainability Report 2014 Talent Management. Google that on YouTube. That looks like what it is. I can't watch yeah. it because then I won't be able to hear it. But. Yes, but uh, we we will watch that. But no, I don't think Techno Buffalo will be going to rap only uh, videos anytime soon. Oh, we please could. no. Uh, <laughs> From Dominique Weber. Uh, do you think Apple will stop releasing new iPads every year now that sales are down? I think they could have skipped the iPad Mini this year for sure. Yeah, but I, th I feel like they're like, oh, here's such ID, um, and, and we'll make it as an option. I think maybe, I don't see it happening, but they need to start showing us why there needs to be upgrades. And I think that's why the rumors of the iPad Pro make sense with multitasking functionality, if you can run two apps side by side. Again, people like me don't want to carry a MacBook Air everywhere, which is, I mean, I'm not complaining. It's not a heavy device. But if you if I could just take my tablet, you know, away for the weekend and I need to do some work or something like that, then maybe this is the sort of the device I'm looking for. And so I think if they can fill a gap each year, then they should continue releasing them. But in the case where you're not really filling a massive gap, then I think this is going to continue because there's no read. You know, there's no reason for us to upgrade, which is sort of what we've been going. Yeah. Uh, from Sajan Bahal, who is the Nexus player for, especially if someone already has a Chromecast, Apple TV, and or Roku player? And how does this come back to gadget overload? I, Good question. Well, first off, I think most people only need one streaming device. And the, your average consumer at most is only going to buy one. They're not going to be like me, who I have a Fire TV. And Apple TV. <laughs> Don't you have everything? <laughs> I, I, well, that's what I cover, so I do. Yes, I, I'm, I even have a Fire Stick on order. You know, it's nice, <laughs> ridiculous. But um, I think it's for just like the Apple TV is for people that are are locked into the Apple ecosystem. The Nexus Player is for those people that have chosen to go with the Google Play ecosystem. Yep. Yeah, you know, so it's, it's... It's exactly... 
That's exactly it, and it adds functionality over the Chromecast. So I think, I mean, it includes everything that Chromecast does, and then it has its own app store. You know, it's quick access to the movies you've already purchased, so it's not necessarily going through your phone or your tablet. It's all right there. You can add a controller, play games. It's sort of like people who really like the Chromecast are invested in Android and want something a little bit more. And it's also not just... So this is just... Again, it come, comes back to a reference platform. This is just a reference for Android TV, which other manufacturers can create. So we're going to see, I'm, sh I'm certain, other, other versions of this. And it's also going to be built into future TVs. So I wouldn't be surprised at CES that we start to see TVs with Android TV built in. Um, so it's not just necessarily for people. It's sort of where... It's sort of Android's next step in the living room, and whether you buy it or not is you know, a totally different question, but it's where it's going. Exactly. And last question for the day from Sasha Bahal. What do you think of the Amazon Echo? I have no idea what they're aiming this at. I made a joke on Twitter. I put, a, I put an iPhone with Siri on top of a paper towel roll and said I just got it. <laughs> and... It's not just Siri. Like I could say, you know, Cortana and Google Now too. But for me, that's that's what I thought about it. I was like, what the heck is this big old Bluetooth speaker that you know you address and say, hey Alexa, you know, what's the weather or whatever. But I think in the future, the goal is, and we see this right now, you can add things to your Amazon shopping list so you buy it later. And I think in the future, you'll say, hey, you know, Alexa, buy me some eggs, and hopefully they won't show up cracked like mine did this morning. Thanks, Fresh Direct. But like. But I think that's it, like a direct portal voice right into Amazon store. Amazon, buy me a Chromecast. already has your account. You know you want it. If you have Prime, it'll be here in two days. Like, why, why have to go through your computer? I think that's where it's going to be important. But it's not there yet. And so right now, it's just sort of this smart home voice console that can listen to you and play music and stuff like that. The, the idea is neat. But I, I also think that my gut reaction is that maybe Amazon is keeping this limited to, you know, interested parties right now. You have to sign up. Like, where else in the world do you sign up for interest to buy something? Like, in the extreme luxury car market? Like, where else? And, you know, but not in gadgets. And I think maybe Amazon's just gauging this to see where the demand is before it goes all kinds of nuts on it, like it did with the Fire Phone, which it took a bath on. So, that's my uh, guess. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I registered for an Echo simply because... We'll need you know one for review and so on, but I registered too. I mean, hundred bucks. Yeah, I'll play with it. I just don't know about you know. Hey Alexa, you know, order me a Chromecast like you said. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Not like, sure. is there demand? That's what I keep asking. Like, do we really need that? Is that how we're going to shop in the future? Maybe. I don't know, but I can't. I don't know. I do, like. It's weird to think about. Like, am I gonna? Because it has like a whole room. I could sit here and say, you know, like, oh, that just came out. Hey, uh, Alexa, order me the Nexus Six. You know, and I'll be like, <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, mm, uh, I don't like, know. is that gonna work? Is that something people want to do? Yeah, no, I. Maybe not, but at least it's trying. I'm gonna to have to see it in action before I make any sort of final decision on it. But right, and to be clear, uh, that's not how it's gonna work. It's at the start. It's like you can add it to your shopping list at the start, and that's just yeah. Cool. Which is why I think it's kind of pointless right now. I agree. Well, that is going to do it for this week's episode of the Techno Buffalo Show. As always, we appreciate you joining us. You can find us on the iTunes Store by searching for the Techno Buffalo Show, and we do appreciate if you rate and review us. It does help the show. You can also find us on Stitcher, which means you can listen to us anytime, anywhere. You can listen to us on Pocket Cast, or you can subscribe via RSS feed. Basically, anywhere there are podcasts, you can find the Techno Buffalo Show. Until next week, I'm Sean Ani. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Techno Buffalo. I have been joined by the Executive Editor of Mobile, Todd Hazelton. Bye, everybody. And we'll see you all back here next week. Till then, take it easy.